Professor Ihab Abuhif is an evolutionary biologist. He has uncovered fascinating secrets about ants and how they have used the environment to change their physiology in order to solidify their social relationships. Ants, tiny creatures, yet they account for one third of the global insect biomass. Ants are social insects. They live in structured nest communities and use chemicals to communicate and cooperate. Ant colonies have long fascinated humans. They've been studied by the military. They form a Spartan form of defense where they'll form like literally a row right in front of the uh, tube and they'll fight to the death, their own death, just to make sure that they don't get to the queen. And ants have been studied by industry. Southwest Airlines, FedEx, they look at the ants, their organization, their ability to cooperate in colonies, and they use those as models, use them in their own scheduling and routing, and all these ant colony optimization algorithms are used in industry as models of efficiency to help them organize their routing and scheduling tasks. So do you have one ant that gives then, does it give it a task to move it on to another ant? Does it move it on to another ant? Or do, are they doing the task sort of in parallel and then joining them together? And these are the kinds of things that they look to see given a task. So you have to take care of the brood. How are they organizing to do that? See, so there's a queen. Ihab Abuhif is a professor of evolutionary biology at McGill University. He is fascinated by ants' many remarkable social behaviors. Ants invented agriculture way before humans. These are the, the leafcutter ants. They've invented, uh, they have policing, they police each other. They make their own graveyards. You know, you even have some cases of what I call suicide bombers or kamikazes. Very interesting. Graduate student Raji Rajakumar works in Abu Hif's lab. Two of the key roles for workers in a colony are to either forage for food or to take care of the, the developing larvae, to actually nurse them. They clean them, they care for them, they protect them, uh, they feed them. Ants live in a female-dominated society. The workers are all female. The males only appear briefly in the spring in order to mate with virgin queens. The warmer spring weather and longer days signal to the already established mated queens that it's time to produce virgin queen and male offspring for mating and dispersal. When and how ants mate is fascinating. Abu Hif noticed just outside his office on one particular day a few summers ago, thousands of queen ants. Now what happens is it's not just the queens and the males from a single colony, it's in the entire area, queens and males are flying. And so for somehow, even in Montreal, the colonies are coordinating somehow. So the colonies here at McGill versus the colonies of this common garden ant at the old port versus somewhere all the way, you know, uh, east of Saint Laurent are all flying precisely, and it all happens within two hours. Within two hours of a single day, one day a year, they all fly up in the air, they all mix, because that way they can mix their gene pool, you know, they can get a diversity. They fall to the ground, like I said, the males die, and then the queens go and they look for their, you know, and it, like, you know, anybody, 80% of the queens die, but 20% of them are able to find other little cracks and crevices and they start to. How they coordinate is something, if I can solve in my lifetime here at McGill, I would be very fortunate, but that is something that fascinates me absolutely. Abu Hif is the Canada Research Chair in Developmental Evolution. He studies how the environment can affect evolution by altering the kinds of organisms that the very same genes can produce. When a queen ant lays an egg, just depending on environmental cues, so temperature, nutrition, photo period, that egg can either develop into a queen or it can develop into a worker. So, you know, it has the potential to do both. Same genes can either turn you into a queen or a worker. What's amazing is that the differences between the queen ant and the worker ants are dramatic. Queen ants can live up to 30 years, the workers just a few months. The queen develops fully functional wings, the workers no wings at all.
The queen can lay millions of eggs, while the workers are, for the most part, sterile. How is it that the same genes, just by interacting with their environment, can make something live for 30 years and something just a few months? If we can unlock that secret or that mystery, we've learned something fundamental about, you know, and probably have the, the tools to then unlock the mystery of longevity, you know, and other kinds of things. It's estimated there are 15,000 different species of ants, and in no case do the worker ants have wings. Abu Hif and his team have discovered that each species seems to turn off its wing development in different ways by turning off different genes. Now, if we can understand why on Earth they're shutting their wings off in different ways, in different species, we understand something about, because that must have been driven by the environment, ecology. It's always the same genes that give rise to the queen and the worker. So they always have to retain the ability to produce wings, but then they just choose to shut off the wings. And if worker ants don't have wings to fly, they cannot participate in the mating ritual. So ants have evolved the ability to respond to the environment in order to alter their gene expression as a strategy for preventing females from leaving the colony to mate with males. Thus, harmony is maintained in their societies. Abuhif has further discovered that in advanced ant societies, reproductive genes in workers have also been altered. Queen lays an egg, if it becomes a queen, that queen can lay proper, normal-looking eggs. If it's a worker, it, when it tries to lay eggs, in the majority of cases, some of those eggs have, are, are messed up because they've got these mislocalized, their genes are not being localized properly. This is a clear consequence of social life, driving you know, the social environment that these things are living in, driving these changes. He calls this the reproductive constraint, in which evolutionary forces work in a group context rather than on individuals, allowing ant societies to enforce harmony through epigenetic modifications. It's a very exciting time to be in science because the technological innovations and the tools that are happening from genomics and in developmental biology and the merging with that of other fields like ecology and evolution is happening, I mean, right now. And I can't be more fortunate to be able to be taking part of this sort of conceptual revolution or riding the wave at this time.